Hi guys, this is Alicia with Good Morning Sunshine. So we have a lot of lectures to get through today. Um, we actually had three hours of toxicology and then we also had parasitology. So I'm gonna start, I'll probably talk really fast, um, but in order to get through all of this information, I'm gonna have to talk really fast. So um, sorry about that, but we learned some interesting stuff today. So um, here we are. So toxicology three, we're on adverse drug reactions and drug interactions. So reactions occurring due to over accumulation of the drug in the animal. So it, it's when the inflow exceeds basically the outgo. Um, so decreased ability to eliminate a drug. We have renal disease, which is decreased filtration, decreased renal secretion. So there's a decrease in the out. Um, and then we have altered metabolism, which is hepatic disease, which includes decreased hepatic um, elimination, competitive inhibition of enzymes by a drug. So this is our decreased outgo as well. And then we have selective organ uptake of the drug. So organ selectivity accumulates drugs in the cells and aminoglycosides, um, nephrotoxicity. So this is the increase in the inflow. Um, so adverse drug reactions, also known as ADRs, which I'm gonna call them. Um, so general, we have general types of ADRs and then we have idiosyncratic idiosyn um, ADRs and then we also have drug interactions. Um, so any toxic or unintended response to a drug that occurs at appropriate therapeutic doses is basically what these are. Um, side effects, um, these are the ones that um, usually happen at therapeutic doses. So we have toxic, we have non-toxic, and we have beneficial or therapeutic. So we're going to focus on, so we have this diagram here, but today we're going to focus on the effective dose, even though this class is about the toxic dose as well as the lethal dose. Um, but these are... Um, get drugs given at therapeutic doses that are not meant to be toxic or their drug is not in the toxic range or lethal dose range, but they still have adverse effects. Um, so let's start with toxic. So we have microlide, um, endo, um, endotoxicides. Um, so we have our avermectins, um, which of course affect collie and collie mixed breeds differently. And then we have our um, milbumycins. Um, so ivermectin, this includes heart guard, we have sentinel, and we also have trifexis. Um, they're used as um, anti-helminthic and heartworm preventatives. Um, so heartworm, we have intestinal parasites, we use for intestinal parasites, skin parasites, and mange. Um, they're applied through multiple routes, such as injection, um, PO, so by mouth, um, that means PO, um, liquid tablets, and then we have pour-on topicals, and we also have topically applied drops. Um, again, some colleagues are deficient in the multi-drug resistant gene, so the MDR1 gene. Um, the MDR1 encodes for the P-glycoprotein at the blood-brain um, barrier. Um, the P-glycoprotein function as, a, as an influx drug transport pump at the blood-brain barrier, like I said. It prevents the entry of ivermectin and mo uh, moxidectin. However, um, dogs that are homozygous, like collies for the MDR1 deletion mutation, display the ivermectin-sensitive um, phenotype, so the ivermectin gets into the brain. So it gets through the blood-brain barrier this way, which isn't good. Um, the mechanism of action, it binds glutamate receptors on the chloride channels in the cell membranes of neurons in the parasite. So increased cell um, permeability to chloride ions, and the chloride ions move into the cell, which then they hyperpolarize, and then that leads to muscle paralysis. Um, microlide endodectocytes um, act as GABA, which is an inhibit, um, inhibitory um, neurotransmitter. Um, GABA is an agonist um, when they bind receptor in the MDR1 deficient animals. Um, clinical signs of this are ataxia, behavioral changes, so such as being depressed or disoriented. Um, we have bradycardia, which means low heart rate. We have hypersalivation, so increase in um, the dog salivating. Um, we have myodriasis, which is enlarged pupils. We also have vomiting, diarrhea, and tremors and seizures. Um, but for non-toxic, um, but they also have an adverse response, which we wouldn't expect for non-toxic. Um, we have corticosteroids given to dogs. Um, so this leads to polyuria and polydipsia. Um, others are THC, um, benzodiazepines, and barbiturates. Um, we have partial inhibition of the antidiuretic hormone, so vasopressin secretion. Um, ADH decreases production of urine by increasing water reabsorption in the renal tubules. Um, but beneficial and therapeutic, we have our diphenhydramine, which is also known as Benadryl. 
Um, our ana it's an antihistamine for an allergy treatment, so it has inverse agonists of histamine H1 receptor, so it binds to the same receptor as histamine. This leading to a um, set of effects, so like it's like a sleep aid and it's um, anxiolytic also. It's a mild inhibitor of reuptake of serotonin, so it crosses the blood-brain barrier and antagonizes the central H1 receptors. So this isn't a bad adverse effect in this case. Um, and then we have our idiosyncratic ADRs. They're unique or unusual. They are individual dependent, so it occurs in animals at therapeutic concentrations. They're host dependent, like I said, but they're not dose dependent. So they rarely occur and are unpredictable. Um, they're dependent on chemical properties of the drug, so maybe it gets converted to a toxic metabolite, um, or they're not really sure what really happens. So they're not um, pharmacological properties. Um, it occurs within one to two months of drug therapy. Um, idiosyncratic hepatotoxicity is more commonly reported. Um, proposed mechanisms, since we don't really know what happens, so because we don't fully understand it yet, um, but some of these mechanisms that we think is metabolic activation of drug to reactivate um, metabolite or metabolites. Um, so through covalent binding of the hepatocellular um, macromolecules, um, we have mitochondrial um, damage, lipid peroxidation, um, oxidative stress, which leads to hepatic um, toxicity. Um, and then we think also um, immune-mediated toxicity. So drug-reactive metabolite um, is added to a biomolecule such as the drug haptin. Um, this yields cellular damage and activation of the immu um, immune system. Or the drug reactive metabolite yields, um, it sensitizes the immune system to the drug causing an immune, immune response. Um, so now we're on toxic or harmful. MSEDs can affect the kidneys and the GI tract. So hepatotoxicity is very rare, but it does happen. Um, such as carprofen, hepatotoxicity drug, um, dogs, um, it occurs within 14 to 30 days during treatment. Um, acute hepatic necrosis with marked increase in ALT, so that's our liver enzyme. Um, so we think um, Labrador, um, the breed Labrador dogs are um, a risk for this. Um, we have idiosyncratic hepatotoxicity, it's rare like I said. Um, but now we're going to get into drug interactions. Um, it's an interaction between two or more drugs that have the opposite effects on the body. So this is a drug plus a poison, a drug plus a drug, or a drug plus a chemical, which we'll go over more in depth. Um, exploited in toxicology and medicine, um, this yields antidotes. Um, types of an um, antagonism is functional, chemical, dispositional, and receptor, which we'll get more in depth also. So starting with functional antagonism, um, so we give the a drug that counteracts the clinical sign here. So it's an interaction between two or more drugs, so this is our drugs plus the poison, that produce opposite <coughs> effects of the same physiological function. Um, so that f physical function is the clinical sign. Um, so we're treating the clinical signs that we observe. Um, and then we have um, strychnine, which, which was originally a toxin, actually. Um, it was an alkaloid toxin from um, the strychnos um, nukes vomica plant. Um, its mechanism of toxicity is to block the inhibitory um, neurotransmitter glycine, um, and it yields CNS stimulation. So excess sensory input is, then happens and exaggerated responses, which leads to rigor. Uh, we have sardonic grin, where the dog just smiles because um, of the sustained um, facial muscle spasms. And then we have seizures and convulsions and sometimes overreact to sound. Um, the treatment for this, so we're trying to calm those muscles down, um, is methylcarbonyl, uh, which is used as an extra label use of human um, therapeutic. Um, we have pentobarbital and also propofol. Um, now getting into chemical antagonism, we have, this is heavy, heavy metal toxicity, where the chemical where they chemically bind to the poison to excrete it out um, safely. So this is a chemical inter, um, interaction or reaction that occurs between two drugs. So again, a drug plus a poison that produces a less toxic product. Um, chelation therapy and heavy metal toxicity here. So we have lead poisoning. Um, so large animals, this is when they usually eat batteries. They <laughs> usually do this and it's usually when small animals eat lead paint. Um, lead yields 97 to 99% bound to hemoglobin in the blood. It is tightly bound to the red blood cells. Um, so it, we always want to send whole blood when we do um, lead testing. Um, this then goes to the liver. Um, this is used sample for lead testing um, when we 
would we would send in a liver for um, necropsy um, as well as kidneys in this case so lead again is 97 to 99 percent bound to hemoglobin in the blood this goes to the liver um, to the brain to the kidney and also to the bone um, chelation therapy the goal is to give a drug that chemically binds to the toxic metal in order to form a less toxic complex so this is the chelation drug plus the toxic metal for excretion So she gave us actually a case that had to do with lead poisoning. Um, there's a sloth named Gage. Um, Gage liked to scrape the paint off his cage and was um, ingesting um, this lead paint. Um, so here was his blood results, which were high. So they were at 0 0.6. And just to give you reference, cats and dogs um, are high above 0.3 and dogs are Sorry, cats and cows are high above 0.3, and then dogs are high when they're above 0.6. So this loss was very high for lead poisoning. But then we gave a drug. So we gave a sh shelter, um, which binds to the toxin so it can get excreted to the urine. Um, the chelator is pulling the lead out of the tissues and the bone. Thus, will this led to the increase in lead poisoning here. So the client freaked out because... It went up here, but that is normal, and it will go back down, as you can see here. Because the lead is pulling, um, or the chelator is pulling the lead out of the tissues and bones. This causing it to go up, but it, then it will go back down. Um, so chemical antagonism continue. We have anti-venom as well, which is antibodies against venom. Um, it's given to counteract um, and venomation by poisonous um, snakes. Um, this usually happens in dogs and horses, actually. Um, so making anti-venom clinics usually don't have this anti-venom on hand because it expires before they actually get to use it. Um, in horses, sheep, and rabbit, they, um, they have immune response and produces antibodies against the venom. Um, the blood collected from the animal, um, the serum is isolated and the antibodies are purified and um, lyophilized. So here's how they make it. Of course, they have the venomous snake. They get the venom from the snake. They dilute it, and it's injected like that. And then we have dispositional antagonism. Um, it's an alteration of absorption, distribution, or excretion of a poison or drug such that the concentration or duration of time um, the poison or drug is at the target organ um, is diminished. So absorption means the administration of activated charcoal or cathartic which helps bind to excrete in the feces we also have apomorphine which helps the animal vomit um, preventing toxic um, absor absorption so we have activated um, petroleum or vegetable origin so not mineral or animal um, it absorbs the toxin or toxicant in the gi tract um, which leads to fecal excretion and it prevents toxin from being absorbed and distributed to the tissues um, this decreases systemic absorption. So implement immediately for maximal absorption to the po um, poison. And then we have receptor antagonism, which is blocking poison from binding. So block the recept receptors they bind to. So it's two chemicals that bind um, the same receptor, producing less toxicity than when given separately. So we have carbon monoxide poisoning. So you administrate um, oxygen to deplace the CO from the hemoglobin. We also have blockers, blockers such as naloxone, which competes with, um, like, um, with morphine. So they're like drugs for the same receptor. So carbon dioxide poisoning or CO poisoning, um, incomplete combustion of fuels, um, malfunctioning space heaters or fireplaces, um, the CO binds to hemoglobin is more than 200 times more affinity than oxygen, which yields um, car um, carb ox oxyhemoglobin, um, supplemental 100% oxygen via endotracheal tubes or giving oxygen to the patient. patient we want to give them a lot of oxygen um, here. So a four-fold faster recovery against high affinity CO bound to the hemoglobin. So then we have opiates and opioids. They're um, nerve system, system depressants. Um, the mechanism of action is an and um, gesia, um, they inhibit neurotransmitter release in response to pain stimulus. They have decreased neuronal cell excitability, um, and this is how it helps with pain. 
So opioid receptors, we have um, a chart here. So here we have our U receptors, which um, CNS, they're peripheral nerve endings, brain, stem, and spinal cord, um, used for physical dependence, respiratory depression, decreased GI motility, and euphoria. We have our K receptors, CNS, peripheral nerve endings, brain, stem, spinal cord, they're used for sedation and meiosis. And then, is that gamma? That's not gamma. Anyways, those receptors, we have CNS, peripheral nerve endings, brainstem, spinal cord, and they're used for anesthesia, antidepressant, and physical dependence. Um, naloxone, um, I'm going to talk about that. They don't, um, they are a blocker or competitive um, antagonist for the same receptor, so it binds all opioid receptors, but strongest um, binding at the MU receptor. So here's our numbers for dog and cat. We have 0.16 mg per kg IM, IV, and sub-Q. We have 0 0.10 mg per kg um, sub-Q or IP in rabbit or rodent. And then we have 0 0.02 mg per kg um, IV for horses. They have a short half-life here, 30 to 60 minutes, so repeated doses may be warranted. So we also have an example of this. We have Golden Gate Bridge and fentanyl. Fentanyl is very potent. So a car crashed on the Golden Gate Bridge in San Fran. Um, an impaired driver collided with a medium barrier, which yields the driver passed out in the car. Um, the firefighter and the highway patrol officer entered the vehicle in order to check on the driver. Um, soon after leaving the roadway, the patrol officer began having clinical signs of fentanyl exposure and being in incapacitated. Um, others on the scene that were hospitalized, there were seven people, uh, officers, a tow truck driver, and other first responders. Um, the extra Narcan units brought um, to the scene, all hospitalized, um, but they all recovered. Um, the suspect was arrested for DUI and possession of that fentanyl. So here, as you can see, fentanyl is potent. If you have one sesame seed, that is horrible. It is stronger than heroin. You would need one sunflower seed or morphine you would need one p of amount these are our lethal opioid do um, doses so again toxidromes include pulmonary toxicant which was our telephon fumes um this i talked about yesterday so our telephon pans um that caused um poisoning um to the birds then we have neurotoxicity which includes um bromethylene so in chocolate so the theobromide that i talked about yesterday for dogs um the macrolide endo Indecticides and the opioids now. And then for hepatotoxicity, we have our aflatoxins. So that was the end of our first toxicology lecture. So again, yeah, that took 17 minutes. Um, on to toxicology four, we have case management and diagnostic veterinary to toxicology. So first step, we're going to examine and stabilize the patient. Second, obtain case history. Three, collect um, vitals. And four, differential diagnosis. Starting with case management, we're an examination and stabilize the patient, get um, case history here, then lead, that leads to treatments and or um, decontamination. And then that leads to differential diagnosis and then to diagnostic toxicology and then five diagnosis and evaluate patient recovery. So starting with examination, performing a thorough physical examination. So you want to access um, condition of uh, assess the condition of an animal. Um, so you have your physical examination, you have your general observation and case history. So here you look for myotic pupils, responses to stimuli, etc. And then you want to conduct laboratory analysis. Um, so these are our clinical chemistries, our CBCs, etc. And then you want to get a case history plus the exam to establish differential diagnoses. Um, toxicosis are frequently missed here. Um, so increased body temper does not rule out um, toxicosis. Um, Pre-existing conditions, you want to remember that, like liver and kidney disease, because these also mimic signs, clinical signs of toxicosis. So establish patient baselines, so collecting vitals, their weight, their heart rate, their pulse rate, their mentation, their respiratory rate, mucous membrane color, blood pressure, and body temperature. You want to stabilize the patient. Patient, You want to preserve life of the patient um, irrespective of the cause. Um, symptomatic supportive treatment of the animal on presentation rewarding in majority of clinical um, toxicology cases. Don't stress about the um, antidotes at this point unless you know what toxin or toxin is the culprit here. And then toxicology emergencies. Um, so you stabilize the patient, you go through the decon, um, 
decontamination of the patient, which is to minimize absorption of the toxin, enhance the excretion or elimination of the toxin, and then remove or dilute topical irritants. So then we're going to get into ABCs of the poison patient. So first we start with airway and breathing. So some chemical and irritant toxins can cause um, bronchospasms. They can inhibit respiratory centers and paralyze respiratory muscles. We can have ta um, tachypnea, which is rapid breathing. Um, this due to carbon monoxide, so anoxia or ethylene glycol antifreeze. They have metabolic acidosis. They have decreased bicarbonate and increased PCO2, um, which they breathe off CO2. So again, we're going to give oxygen here, here through the endotracheal tube, so positive pressure, ventilation, or manual delivery of oxygen here. Um, we have pulse, um, oximetry monitoring, and blood gas as well. Now our C for our ABCs is circulation, so we're going to assess based on physical exam. We have mucous membrane color. Is it pale, which would um, be of anticoagulant um, roto rodent testicides, or is it brown? This would have to do with nitrites and acetyl. Um, minofin. Um, we're going to look at blood pressure. Is it hypotension? So this would have to do with beta blockers or benzodiazepines. And then we can have hypertension, so increase in blood pressure. This would have to do with ibuprofen, so a kidney, um, or our SSRIs. And then we have body temperature. Is it hyperthermia? So really hot. This will give this hot and seizure causing poisons, drugs. Or is it really, are they really cold? So this would have to do with um, opioid poisoning. Is their heart rate high or is it low? Um, if it's low, it has to do with op op or carbonates or opioids. If it's high, it has to do with caffeine or chocolate. Um, and then three is disability and deficits. Um, this we would assess assess gross neurological deficits, um, pupillary um, light reflex, so meiosis. Are their pupils constricted or? Uh, Mitre aces are they? Do they have enlarged pupils? Enlarged pupils would lead to thinking about marijuana or SSRIs, um, atropine. If they're constricted, um, this will lead us to believe for opioid, opioids or our carbonate pesticides. Um, we also want to look at their mental status. So overstimulated, lethargic, uninterested, or we want to look at their ambulation. So how well are they walking? And also gastrointestinal, so listening for those bowel sounds. And then four, lastly, of our ABCs, we have diagnostics. So we're going to conduct laboratory analysis. Um, this can guide differential um, diagnosis in toxicology cases. So we're going to look at glucose, their liver enzymes like ALP, ALT, AST, and GGT. Also the um, creatine kinase, um, this tends to go up in overstimulation. And also prothrombin and activated partial thromblastin times. So our PT and our PTT, these are our clotting times. And then we have our creatine and BUN. We also have our electrolytes, um, sodium, potassium, and calcium, and this may include other diagnostics. So we may perform a urinalysis or an ultrasound, um, and then we're going to do chemical, uh, clinical chemistry, CBCs, etc. So we could do liver function tests, which there are all kinds here. So ALT converts proteins into energy for liver cells. AST metabolizes amino cells, and ALP breaks down proteins. Um, what this means, increased means released into the bloodstream with liver damage. And then we have bilirubin, which is the pro um, production of RBC breakdown. This has to do with liver damage or types of anemia. And our GGT is, they transport molecules, they help um, liver metabolize drugs and toxins. So increase in this is released into the bloodstream with liver damage. And then we have our kidney function test. So we have cre um, creatinine, um, what is it? This is kidneys filter creatinine um, from the blood. Um, it's a waste product from muscle metabolism. And then we have our BUN, so our blood, urea, and nitrogen. Um, so the, what is this? This is urine, nitrogen is um, broken down, um, product of protein um, catabolism removed by kidneys. Um, all of this means is increase equals released into the bloodstream with kidney damage. Then we can also do a urine analysis, like I said, or radiographs or other diagnostics. And then we have decontamination of the patient. So methods of toxin absorption. So method of um, decontamination depends on the route of exposure. So it, we have external exposure, which include ocular exposure, dermal exposure, inhalation exposure, and all those. So methods, let's start with ocular decontamination. So the stuff that gets into the eye. So we have irritant, which is the label on the product may read caution. 
Um, the owner irrigate eyes with saline, eye wash, and tap or tap water. Um, and they're gonna monitor eyes for redness, pawing eyes, swelling, lacrimation. But then you would want to see a DVM. Um, and then we have corrosive, which is a bigger offender. So the labor on the product may read danger. The owner is then to irrigate the eyes with saline, eye wash, or tap water and antibiotic drugs or ointment. Um, they want to, Elizabeth Collar, they want to monitor for progressive signs and damage and do a forcing stain. Um, this would be done at a bed, obviously. Um, methods of dermal decontamination, so dermal exposure to irritants or corrosives. We want to disinfect um, cleaners, so these are our acids and alkalines. We have glues, adhesive, they can also include um, pyrethrins, um, systemically absorbed in cats. Um, tea tree oil can also be bad. We want to make sure um, owners are, are diluting this because usually when you buy it, it's a 100% concentration. And we have topical pain creams and essential oils as well. We have irritants and corrosives, so you want to rinse or bathe for 15 minutes with a degreasing dish soap in this case. Also topical vitamin E or um, burn care. Um, systemically absorbed toxins, you want to bathe two to three times with a decreasing dish soap here. Activated charcoal might be indicated and supportive care and blood work may be needed depending on toxicant involved. So methods of inhalation, um, decontamination. So birds are the most sensitive to inhalation toxicity. The exposure to toxic gases can happen in any species though, like pigs, poultry, and humans. Examples of these, again, Teflon um, fumes off the Teflon plates that we talked, or pans that we talked about, um, carbon monoxide poisoning, hydrogen sulfide, and nitrogen dioxide. Um, we wanna remove the animal from the source. If minor irritant, um, give them some fresh air. Um, humidified oxygen cage and supportive care, so like fluids and heat, etc. Um, and now getting into oral exposure, the most common route of exposure. Um, know when and how to decontaminate. So you want to know the case history. So what is it? When was it? How bad is it? Um, here we want to do emesis, activated charcoal, gastric lavage, endoscopy, surgery, and lipid emulsion therapy. So ingestion of corrosive agents, um, we don't want to do induce vomiting in these animals. We um, dilution with milk or water, but you don't also don't want to give too much of this because they could aspirate. You want to give a domosent, so liquid formulation that coats the GI or other mucoprotective agents, such as melanta, milk of magnesia, um, KO pectate. That's for dogs only, though. However, cats do not metabolize um, salicylates well. Prevention of toxic absorption inducing um, emesis. Emesis is vomiting. Um, it's apomorphine, like I talked about earlier. So this is a medic activity. It stimulates dopamine receptors in this case, given um, parenterally, so IM or IV, or topically in the conjunctival sac. Um, this triggers the vomiting center, also known as the CRTZ, which induces, induces vomiting. So this is the preferred emetic drug for dogs. We also have Clever. Um, this is a new drug, so it works, but sometimes it doesn't. Um, it's an ophthalmic solution, so you put in the eye for use in dogs. Dopamine agonist, um, it drops depends. The drop you give in the eye depends on the dog's body weight. Um, the CRTs in the medulla in the brain, um, the defensive BBT detects circulation toxins in the blood and the cerebral spinal fluid when activated by nerve impulses from the vomiting set center. Um, the integrated vomiting center induces the vomit reflex. Um, it increased gastrone and decreased mobility. The gastric muscles relax, um, retrograde um, peristalsis. Um, salvation happens and pallor and sweating. Um, apomorphine in cats, however, you don't really want to use. It's poor response in cats due to fewer dopamine receptors. Um, the side effects of CNS and respiratory dis um, depression um, protracted, so that means can't stop vomiting. Um, set of side effects, reverse with naloxone. This does not stop the vomiting, however. Treatment for vomiting, you want to do a pro, um, you want to use serenia, um, which blocks the neurotransfer involved in vomiting, and, or reglin, which increases GI muscle contractions. And then you've probably heard that you can use hydrogen peroxide in order to induce vomiting as well. This is a main use at home to cause your animal to vomit. However, they, it causes GI upset but the animal should vomit with 10 minutes. If not, take it to the vet, please. 
Um, dogs currently recommended for at home um, vomiting induction in dogs only 3% used. Um, higher concentration equals severe gastritis. Um, it induces vomiting by causing direct gastric irritation. So again, in 10 minutes, um, one to five meals per kg body weight. So do not exceed 50 meals given to your dog. On um, the client based measurement, five meals actually equals about one teaspoon. Um, make sure it's fresh, not expired, and three percent um, hydrogen peroxide. For cats, it's ineffective in cats, question mark. Um, they have hemorrhagic gastritis, froth and foam at the mouth, and sometimes don't even vomit if you give it to them. Um, it burns usually noted at the arrival at the clinic. Um, given once to the patient at home, then need you need to take your cat to the vet. Um, emetic, emetic agents are preferred use in cats, so are um, xylosine or our dexmedetomidine, um, emetic activity that stimulates, um, the alpha-2 endronergic receptors and vomiting center. So cats are considered emetics of choice. Um, side effects are CNS and respiratory depression, bradycardia, hypertension. Um, side effects are reversed with, um, yohimbind. Know when to induce vomiting. So recent ingestion, less than an hour. Um, financial constraints of the owner. Um, asymptomatic patient um, can induce um, less than or equal to six hours. So if they ingest grapes, raisins, um, exlitol, massive ingestions, chocolate, um, bazaars, um, drugs that decrease gastric emptying. Um, so our, those are our opi opioids, anticholinergic, um, so atropine, um, tricyclic antidepressants, and um, salicylates. Um, contradictions um, for MS induction, so vomiting induction. So this is when we do not want to induce vomiting in these cases. So if the patient is symptomatic, um, laryngeal paralysis, megaesophagus, or risk of aspiration pneumonia. So this includes our brach brachiocephalic breeds, so our bulldogs, our Boston terriers, our pugs. Um, the ingestion of hydrocarbons are more at risk for asp aspiration. Um, so those are our petroleum products, our gasoline, our kerosene, our motor oil, and if they're less than three months old. Um, ingestion of corrosive agents include batteries, like I said, for large animals, the toilet bowl or drain cleaners, oven cleaners, um, and again, if the patient's seizing, um, rodents, horses, um, ruminants, and rabbits. Um, the prevention of toxicant absorption, um, gastric larvage, so stomach pumping, that's what that means. Um, it requires PEP, IV, catheter, sedation, intubation, endotracheal insufflation, um, flushed with 5 to 10 um, milliliters of, per kg of warm water. This agitates the stomach, aspirate contents, pump stomach. Flush stomach until you see three or more cycles of nothing coming out. When to perform this? So this is the ingestion of the animal ingests is a toxic with a narrow margin of safety. So insecticides are charlie cholesterol, um, rodenticide, calcium channel, or beta blockers. Um, also for the ingestion of toxic dosing approaching LD50. Also ingestion of large amounts of products. So iron, tab, aspirin. Also a symptomatic patient when amesis is contra Predicted, um, seizures unconscious still requiring um, decontamination, um, large animal explosion to toxin or toxins. Let's talk about activated charcoal. This binds to the toxin to excrete in feces. So activated petroleum or vegetable origin, not mineral or animal. It absorbs the toxin and toxin in the GI tract, which leads to fecal excretion. This decreases systemic abs um, absorption. Um, implement a medium for maximal um, absorption to po um, poison um, the affected for toxins that undergo um, enterohepatic recirculation. Types available are toxapan or liquid charvet with or without um, cathartic, so 70% sorbitol. So sorbitol um, draws water into the intestinal lumen. Um, repeated doses yields hyperatronemia, so too much sodium. So even with delayed administration, decreased absorption by 25 to 30%. Um, cathartic so, um, sorbitol is poorly absorbable salts that osmotically draw water into the gut lumen. This stimulates movement, enhancing elimination of activated charcoal. So for large animals, Magnesium sulfate and sodium sulfide are used as cathartics. Um, sorbitol can be used as a laxative or a cathartic. This is a single dose, one to two grams per kilogram with or without cathartic. And then if you're giving multiple doses, you want to do this without cathartic. Used for SR, XR, ER meds, ingested. You want to wait for doses to pass.
and modern monitor their sodium levels. Um, toxicants that undergo enterohepatic recirculation. So read the dosage for um, product. So what does not bind to activated charcoal? So when would you not use this? Um, alcohols, ethanol, glycol, ethanol, um, excitalol, heavy metals, nitrates, nitrites, and chlorates. Um, the contraindications for activated charcoal. So don't give these in these in instances. Um, when there's a late stage presentation, when dog has hyperatremia um, or hypovolemic shock, um, they have a compromised airway, GI obstruction, or risk of aspiration pneumonia, or vomiting animal, or lack of um, borbigamine. Um, gastric lavage, so may be more affected at removing gastric contents in this case. Um, so when? So then just have deadly uh, medications, life-threatening situations, so such as beta blockers, um, metaldehyde, calcium channel blockers. Um, when you have uns unsuccessful um, emesis, so when you can't get the um, animal to vomit, um, species that can't vomit, or sy symptomatic patients with lard ingestion. So then gastric larvage requires PrEP, again, IV catheter, all these things, intubation, and all that stuff I talked about. You perform um, this one, the ingestion of a toxicant with narrow margin of safety, so insecticides, ivermectin, um, calcium channel or beta blockers, um, then just some toxic dose approaching LD50, um, and all these things that I talked about earlier. Um, when you not use this is when the animal had a recent surgery, the patient is unstable, uh, or the ingestive hydrocarbons are corrosive. Um, gastric larvae risk are aspiration pneumonia, es um, esophageal gastric respiratory, and electrolyte imbalances. Um, we have lipid emulsion therapy, which is typically soybean oil. It creates a lipid sink in the blood, um, which yields lipid binds highly to lipid-soluble toxins. You want to give IV as a bolus dose at 1.5 mils per kg, so 20% lipid emulsion. This is followed by infusion of 0.25 mils per kg, so every 30 to 60 minutes. So repeat a blood, not lipid field in the PCV tube. So you would see the lipid bio layer about 1-2% to of volume. Um, you want to mon monitor vitals in this case. In the case reports, microlide, endoectoside um, overdose, um, baclofen, so that's a muscle, muscle relaxer, NSAIDs, marijuana, tremogenic um, mycotoxins. So case histories, so toxicology emergency. You want to calm down the pet livestock owner and prevent additional exposure to toxicant. Is it life-threatening? Require emergency care for the animals. Um, determine potential route of exposure. Is it oral? Should owner induce um, emesis at home on the way to the clinic or any other animals or people at risk for exposure? Um, the longer the animal is at home, the longer animal is delayed emergency care. So bring animal in, um, go do on-site visit. Ask owner questions that are open-ended questions. Describe, explain, can you tell me about this will encourage them to elaborate more instead of just answering yes or no. You want to obtain a complete case history. So listen to the client. Be thorough. Establish trust. Avoid um, preconceptions. Um, the pet livestock owners may give inaccurate histories. Confirm active ingredients and products. You want to attain a medical history, so identify current medications and prior medical history. Pre-existing conditions can mimic clinical signs of toxicosis. Inquire about home environment, inside versus outside, on pasture versus feed. Other animals at residence, neighboring, is the neighbor ill? Any changes in food? Medications used in the household, chemicals, plants on property and house, children in the household, um, so this is for human component. Establish a timeline of exposure event. Acute onset of signs more indicative of toxicosis. Animal more likely to die if presenting acutely. So important things to keep in mind. Keep all your differentials open. Remain open-minded and objective. I think my neighbor poisoned my dog. Does that mean the animal is poisoned? Beware of I read on the internet. Never tell the client your animal was poisoned without conclusive evidence. Um, diseases progress and change in appearance with time. Most diseases um, encounter will have a single cause or one causative agent. Um, confirm active ingredient in the product for which the pet was exposed and try to get an estimate on quantity ingested. Um, bromethylene or brodifacuum, um, diaphanone or diphethylone. Um, this all means vitamin D. Call upon toxicologists, animal poison control centers, um, human medications like LA, XR, etc. Contact local pharmacy, prison control centers, and then for plants, local forest or plant ID specialists. 
treatments. Stabilize the animal and treat life-threatening problems. Treat the patient, not the poison. Don't, for, what, don't wait for toxicology results. So summary, treat the patient, not the poison. Get a complete history of the animal. Stabilize the animal for attempted um, decontamination procedures. Know when to decontaminate and what procedures to use. <laughs> So again, top 10 things to collect for toxicology testing, liver, stomach contents, rumen contents, brain, kidney, urine, whole, blood, suspect, food, serum, suspect, source material, fixed tissues, and formalin for histology. And that was the end of that lecture. Sorry, that's a lot of information. Um, and then toxicology five, we talked about toxicants um, affecting the nervous system. Um, so we have neurotoxins and neurotoxicants, very potent. Um, they have acute toxicity. They're a threat to animals, owners, DVM, vet tech personnel, human food supply, food animals, dairy animals. We have in, um, insecticides and pesticides. We have pyrethrins and pyrethroids. We have organophosphates um, and carbamates. Um, these are starting to taper off. They're not used as much anymore. Medications, we have antidepressants and axiolytics. Um, we have illicits such as marijuana. So starting with pyrethrins and pyrethroids. Sorry, my throat's getting a little dry. Um, pyrethrins are derived from um, chrysanthemum flowers. Um, pyrethroids are flea products. Um, they are um, synthetic analogs. They're greater um, stability and potency than our pyrethrins. Um, generally combined with the synergist, so um, piperonol, so butotoxoid and octanol bicycohepatitis. Um, there's many others. Um, they enhance they enhance the effect of the insecticide. Um, they're generally safe for manuals, higher selective ratio than other insecticides. They're far more selective for insect than the, um, mammals. Um, our pyrethroids are 136 times less toxic than our orgophosphorus and 280 times less toxic than carbamate insecticides. Um, products include sprays, dips, ear tags, collars, spot on liquids, pour on liquids, granules, shampoos, Advantage, Sentry, Frontline, Advantage, Hearts, UltraGuard collars, and many other product lines. The mechanism of toxicity for these, they bind to the voltage dependent um, sodium channels and neurons causing prolonged um, sodium influx in neurons. Um, sodium moves into the nerve cell and the nerve then fires. It causes hyperexcitability of cells by showing the closing of sodium channels. This causes neurons to depolarize, depolarize so fires, which leads to neuronal excite, um, excitation. Um, me mechanism of toxicity in these, we have type 1 and type 2. Type 1 has no alpha cyano group, um, perithrin, Perithrin, allothrin, um, resmethrin, phenethrin, um, prolonged depolarizing act, action potential, repeated of neuron firing, so nervous system stimulation. Type 2 has an alpha cyano group. Um, this is our delta methrin, um, phenyl allurate, our cyphlorithrin. This is the suppression of action potential and reduced ability of the nerve um, to fire, so this duration of action is longer. Type 1 is known as also known as T syndrome, so this is tremor syndrome. Progressive body tremors, we have hyperexcitability, we have exaggerated startle response and prostration. Our type 2 is our CS syndrome, so prolonged firing of nerves. This is our um, choreo, um, choreothortosis, our salvation syndrome. So we have hypersalvation, weakness, irregular contractions, ataxia, and tonic seizures. Um, clinical possession can be difficult. Other clinical signs... <laughs> Sorry, my throat really hurts. Um, other clinical signs, acute doses or repeated over-application, so protective vomiting, diarrhea. We have dermal oral exposure, signs usually self-limiting, um, allergic reactions, hypersalvation, paw flicking, ear twitching. Um, and Cats are very sensitive um, to concentrated pyrethrin products. Um, this leads to permethrin. Um, using formulations meant for dogs, not cats. Cats being in close contact with dogs after the permethrin products have been applied. Um, clinical signs in cats, a um, few hours to 24 hours. These include depression, anorexia, vomiting, hypersalvation, grooming behavior in contact with the product, facial twitching, generalized muscle tremors or seizures, hyperthermia from seizures, and death. Um, fish are also sensitive as well, so keep dogs out of ponds after application of these, run off during um, agriculture use, drift. 
hyperactivity, loss of schooling behavior, um, guilt, and jaw spasms. Clinical findings, um, severe cases equals increased creatine kinase. Diagnosis, a history of exposure, detection in fur, blood, or brain. Um, the treatment for these is ingestion of large quantities, not symptomatic, then induce vomiting and or give activated charcoal. For allergic skin reactions, we want to bathe in warm water and liquid dish detergent, topical vitamin E, and diphenhydramine. Um, for tremors and seizures, we want to calm the muscles in this case, so uh, methocarbinol, phenobarbital, uh, mitozolam, and propofol. So, okay. Um, a cat was exposed to 45% um, permethrin dermally, so spot on. Um, within four hours, hypersalivating, um, it had severe tremors and seizures. Um, the cat's physical contact with other pets after application of spot on products. Um, the dog formulations can have clinical signs. Um, and then we have poisoning poisonous snake. So owner lived in close proximity to a grocery store, consequently had roach infection. Um, amateur um, herpetologist owned 25 boa const um, constrictors and 10 um, python vipers. Um, they re the coach, they had a roach problem and they put out and they fogged the house. This guy fogged his house with all of his snakes inside. Um, and this fog had pyrethroid insecticide in it. Um, he left the snakes in the house with poor ventilation. All the windows closed. They all died. Um, yeah, don't do that. Um, also, cats and fish aren't the only species sensitive to the pyrethrin-based insecticides. Like I said, snakes, like that one example, turtles, and lizards as well. Um, so again, animals most sensitive to our pyrethrin, uh, pyrethroid toxicity are fish, reptiles, which includes snakes, turtles, and lizards, and also cats. So getting into neurotoxicity, these are our toxins and toxicants, so our insecticides and pesticides. We're going to go into now organophosphates and carbamates. Um, common causes of insecticide poisoning in animals is malicious intent, accidental exposure, misuse, or overuse of a product. Um, sources are general insect control, so more diluted, so our porons are dips for pets, insecticidal powders, granules are flea sprays and foggers, agricultural uses, more concentrated products, control crop press, so um, corn, rootworm, nematodes, etc. So corn, soybeans, potatoes, alfalfa. Um, our toxicokinetics, throughout of exposure is dermal, inhalation, and oral, so it readily absorbed, is distributed throughout the body, excreted in the urine. Common products, just for curiosity, are our carbonates, our carbaryl, um, our propoxer, our carboferrin, our methamol, and then our organophosphates are our diazinone, our tetrachloroinphos, and our turbophos. Um, the mechanism of toxicity for these, the nervous system and acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is an, um, the neurotransmitter for the entire parasympathetic nervous system. Um, some parts of the sympathetic nervous system and CNS, somatic nerves, um, in innervating skeletal nerves. Um, nervous system, orgophosphates, and carbonate insecticides inhibit the enzyme acetylcholine esterase and other um, colon esterases. Um, acetylcholine esterase is responsible for hydrolyzing the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. Um, when it is inhibited, acetylcholine um, builds up at the neuromuscular junction. So the accumulation of acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction causes excessive stimulation of muscarinic, nicotinic, and CNS cholinergic receptors. Um, the parasympathetic pathway overstimulates. Um, the sympathetic pathway also overstimulates and also the central nervous system. Um, clinical signs, so muscarinic signs are parasympathetic overstimulation, and then we have our SLUD signs, which include salvation, lacrimation, urination, defecation, dips, um, dyspnea, and emos emesis, so that's vomiting. Um, our cholinderic toxidromes, so our nicotinic acetylcholine receptor overstimulation, we have a stimulatory phase, so where muscles, um, fasciolations and tremors initially, um, then we have muscle stiffness, and then after stimulatory phase is followed by flaccid paralysis, weakness due to muscle um, fatigue. We have CNS signs such as restlessness, ataxia, confusion, and depression. We also have death, which is the inhibition of the medullar respiratory center in the um, CNS. We have excessive bronchial secretions, bronchoconstriction, and paral um, paralysis of the diaphragm. 
And then, which leads to respiratory failure. So nicotinic receptor blockade, airway obstruction by copious amounts of respiratory secretions and bronchoconstriction. So our diagnosis of these, so history of exposure may observe increase in AST and um, creatine kinase. Diagnostic test, we'd measure acetylcholine esterase activity. So blood and brain. So the activity is less than 50% of the normal acetylesterase activity in that species is suggestive ex exposure, but most cases of toxicity is less than 25% of normal reference range. And the, then the detection of OP or carbonate, the blood, liver, um, stomach contents, bait, or suspicious material. Um, treatment is emergent. Um, death can occur rapidly in minutes with extremely toxic organophosphates and carbonates. Um, signs can vary widely, so need to treat the signs which are present in addition to giving specific antidote. Uh, we have muscarinic signs, so atropine sulfate antidote, which blocks uh, muscarinic receptors. It's a non-competitive antidote that blocks muscarinic receptors from the acetylcholine overstimulation, so no effect on nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. You can give a pre and test dose. Um, we, don't need, we didn't need to memorize this. Um, but then the treatment for organophosphates, we have um, prolidoxamine or protopam chloride. Um, it reactivates acetylcholesterase by releasing organophosphate from the enzyme. It's effective within 24 to 48 hours post-exposure. After 48 hours, organophosphate cannot separate from acetylcholesterase. So then it won't work. Um, for dermal exposure, you want to bathe the animal for ingestion of it. Do not induce vomiting if ingested insecticide is a liquid. Um, not liquid, you want to induce vomiting. Um, for ingestion of flea cars, may require removal. Um, gastric larvage, activate up charcoal um, sorbitol if no diarrhea. GI protectants as needed. Um, seizures, nicotinic signs, you want to give diazepam or phenobarbital. Um, neurotoxicity, toxins, and toxicants. We're on to our antidepressants and our axiolytics. Um, the mechanism of action is block reuptake of serotonin, to serotonin which yields the buildup of serotonin um, at presynaptic membrane. Um, serotonin is a neurotransmitter involved in the CNS. It enhances mood behavior, body temperature regulation, cardiovascular function, muscular contractility. Um, for humans, it's an antidepressant. can be used for anxiety in animals. Um, it's used in met vet med for behavioral is issues, so urine spraying, canine separation, anxiety, and two to three times overdose it equals clinical signs more likely. Um, it's rapidly absorbed. It has a rapid onset of signs. Um, serotonin, no epinephrine, um, reuptake inhibitor. So these are CNRIs. Um, this is vanil um, vaccine. Um, cats love the smell of this, actually, and our Dolex Xcine. So serotonin, no epinephrine, reuptake inhibitor, SNRI. A small increase in dopamine, extended release forms, taste preference. Again, cats like it, so don't leave it open. Um, Clinical signs evident is one to eight hours post inject injection. Um, the clinical signs are agitation, tremor, seizures, hyperactive, hyperthermia, um, mydriasis, vomiting, diarrhea, hypersalivation, tachycardia, hypertension, and hyperventilation. Um, our ADHD and AD ADD drugs, um, the mechanism of action is our amphetamines and our sympathomimic drugs. Enhance effects of no norepinephrine, dopamine. Um, they are structurally related to um, no norepinephrine. Can increase serotonin release, um, which yields serotonin syndrome. Um, you normalize activity in frontal brain regions, enhancing temporal um, discrimination. And then we have our sympathetics, our fight or flight. Um, these include. Um, Clinical signs include head bobbing, tremors or seizures, coma, flicking of the ears and tail, agitation, hyperactivity, and stuff like that, hypertension. And the treatment of these, so agitation, you want to use ACE, um, ACE promazine, chloropromazine, which blocks our serotonin and dopamine receptors. Um, tachycardia, you want to use um, pro prenol. Um, seizures and tremors, you want to use phenobarbital, diazepam, met methocarbinol. Um, serotonin syndrome, you want to use cyprohepatidine, which is serotonin antagonist. Um, yeah. You want to induce vomiting if you catch it early enough. You want to use activated charcoal plus cathartic um, times one dose. You want to monitor the, um, their ECG and the blood pressure. You want to do IV fluid therapy. Then you want to maintain body temperature and you want to keep it in a dark, quiet room. So again, garbage 
poisoning, which is also known as bacterial food poisoning, more common in heat in summer and warm climates and around holidays. We have our E. coli, our Salmonella, our Clostridium, our Staphylococcus, and our Streptococcus. Um, so sources and ingestion of molding food or decomposing organic matter, so dairy foods, walnuts, peanuts, spaghetti, compost. Um, toxins include paraterm A, produced by penicillium, um, um, and then we have the mechanism of toxicity. Exact me mechanism is actually unknown. Interference with normal um, presynaptic neurotransmitter release, and they act as a glycine inhib inhib inhibitory neurotransmitter agonist in the brain amp of the nervous system. Clinical signs are 30 minutes to 3 hours post-ingestion, so tremor, seizures, ataxia, ta um, tachycardia, vomiting, hyperthermia, depression, hyperexcitability, hypersalvation, metabolic acidosis, and agitation. Our treatment would be vomiting, gastric lavage, activated charcoal, um, symptomatic supportive, methylcarbonyl, diazepam, phenobarbital, um, pentobarbital if they're seizuring, and propanolol if they're tachycardic. Um, again, prognosis is good if, um, with early aggressive treatment. Diagnosis, history of exposure, clinical signs, identification of penetrum A or rock fortine. Um, so then we have our neurotoxins, which include plants and mycotoxins. So the nervous system stimulates, um, this is our chocolate, so our cocoa plant and our tree orogenic mycotoxins. Um, now we're gonna talk about marijuana, um, which he said, basically marijuana, um, we don't, it's not, um, hold on, where was I going with this? Cause she didn't really talk about it a lot. She ran out of time here, so. But anyways, prognosis is usually good, except for concentrates in medical marijuana. Um, we have a pet poison helpline, so edibles is the number one source of exposure. So our brownies, our cookies, our chocolate bars, gummy bears, um, butter, coconut oil, um, THC concentrates. Number source is dried plants, up to 30% THC. Um, lesser extent inhalation, one gram cigarette equals 150 milligrams THC. Uh, mechanism of action, CNS depression, increases serotonin and dopamine. Um, it is not regulated, but people still use it in dogs. Um, but it's bad if they get ingest the medical marijuana most of the time. This is where we see toxicity. And that was the end of that lecture. I have parasitology, but I may not go over. I'm going to run through it real fast. Um, we're still on protozoa. Our protozoan parasites, um, we're talking about flagellates today. So our flagellate parasites have a flagellum um, in at least one stage of, the, of their life cycle. Some are extracellular, some are both intercellular and extracellular. Um, so we have Giardia, which we've all probably heard of. It's the most common parasite of animals and humans in the U.S. It's a cause of diarrhea in animals and humans. It's a parasite of the small intestine. It's extracellular. It exits in two forms. So as a trophozoite, which is the flagellate stage, and a cyst, which is an infective stage. Um, trophozoite is the general term, meaning active feeding stage of the protozoa. It's difficult to see. So if you see this in feces, you know it's active, and it's only seen in diarrhea feces. It has a direct life cycle. Its transmission is fecal-oral, so infective in the feces. Um, following ingestion, the organ um, exists, releasing trophozoites. Trophozoite is a teardrop shape, has two nuclei, multiple flagella, and a sucking disc. Um, relocates as needed, asexual, multiplication only. Organism in posterior small intestine and cyst, and the cysts have four nuclei, so two trophozoites passed out into the feces. Um, the most infectious asymptomatic can produce diarrhea. Um, the pathogenesis is unclear, can produce mucosal inflammation, virus atrophy, reduce digestive enzyme production, and malabsorption di diarrhea. Um, cysts survive for a while in the environment, um, better in wet areas than dry. They survive a few months in cold water, less time out of the water probably. Has led to the idea that it is a waterborne parasite, but it does not have to be in water. Susceptible to desiccation, harsh weather conditions, and susceptible to disinfectants, but not to the level of bleach and water um, supplies. Which animals infected with Giardia? Essentially all domestic um, mammal species, wild mammals, birds, different species, um, reptiles, different species. 
Where is it recognized as a problem and treated? Primarily small animals are dogs and cats. Some evidence um, it affects growth in food animals, but control is not practical. Um, Giardia on small animals, one of the most common internal parasites detected, early transmitted from one animal to another, um, cyst immediately infected, most infectious subclinically, um, clinical infections are more common, so diarrhea, vomiting, flatulence, and unthriftiness. Um, diagnosis is by finding cyst in fecal samples and antigen tests, do fecal flotation if there is no diarrhea, but do not do an antigen test here. Um, is it zoonosis? Um, most publications refer to it as a zoonotic infection. Um, Giardia divided into assemblages, um, genetically distinct, morphology similar. So assemblages A and B is for human. This can be zoonotic. That's why it's called a zoonotic infection. However, assemblages C um, is in dogs. Um, this is not zoonotic. Also for livestock, it's not zoonotic. And for cats, it's not zoonotic. Um, but animals are occasionally infected with A and B. So can so can't say categorically that it's not a isn't a zoonosis. Um, so no epidemiological evidence that there is uh, much transfer between animals and people. Um, then we have our trichomonad parasites, which the flagellates of the GI tract and reproductive tract. Um, they have undulating membrane. Um, they have no cyst stage, only trophozytes. Um, it's called trictic um, ammonis futus. Um, flagellate of cattle um, transmitted sexually. It's extracellular and inhabits the uterus of the cows. Um, Preputial cavity of bulls. Um, it can produce infertility, early embryonic death, pyometra, um, fetal death at 60 to 120 days. It's seen as high rate of open cows, extended calving in the next season. It causes early embryonic death, not abortion, because it makes the endometrium um, in hospital for implant. Planation. Um, important causes of fetal death in beef cattle, especially farther west. Um, and only exit is trophozyte. There's no cyst. Only um, venereal transmission. Um, diagnosis usually by collecting a preputial scraping sample from a bull. PCR is the most sensitive test. There's no effective proof treatment. Um, coal infected bulls. Um, bulls are killed if tested positive. However, rest is um, what you do for infected cows. Um, interstate movement of bulls usually requires testing for T. futis. Um, another species of this is T. blackburni. Um, it can cause chronic large bowel diarrhea in cats. It initially thought to be the same species in cats and cattle, now recognizes different species. It occurs most often in catteries and shelters. There's no real treatment and often resolves over an extended period of time. Um, flagellates, uh, their intestinal flagellates occur commonly in other species. Many non-pathogenic might be seen on fecal or GI smears. Um, some species are pathogenic sometimes. These include um, birds and reptiles. So trichomonas and gallinae is in birds. That can be pathogenic sometimes, but sometimes it won't. Um, it's not very common. It affects a wide variety of birds, including raptors and pigeons. Heavy infection causes co um, coalescing caseous masses in mouth and um, crop. Clinically affected birds are anorexic and unthrifty may be a problem in aphries. And then we have our hemoflagellants, our, our trypanosomes. Um, they're a very important group of animal and human parasites worldwide. They're transmitted by insect vectors found in mammals in two forms. We have our tripomastigote, which is extracellular in blood, and then we have our mastigote, which is intracellular. Our trypanosomes are the only species of interest is our tramp Trimpanosoma cruzi. Um, this infects dogs and a wide variety of wild animals. So our opossums, raccoons, armadillos, coyotes, and bears. Um, reports mostly from southeast, but infection in wildlife quite common in Virginia. Also infects humans. So Chagas disease is not is a disease, but it's not the infection. So a significant disease in South America. Um, cruzi, the intermediate host, is a triatomin bug also known as a kissing bug. It's blood feeding. Species found around here, reclusive. You are not likely to see them. Um, the intermediate host feeds on the dog, so it deposits organism near the bite site. Um, trypanosomes are rubbed into opening. Other rights, routes of infection include ingestion of infected animal or bug or direct blood contact, so the bite or vertical transmission. Um, infection can be asymptomatic. Some dogs develop chronic myocarditis, um, significant cause of heart disease in southern some southern states like Texas and Louisiana, in humans that can also cause heart disease. Um, the epidemiology of this, Texas and other southeastern states, transmission from bugs to dogs and occasionally humans. Um, several incidental cases seen in dogs in Virginia. Serological testing indicates parasite present, especially in hunting dogs, dogs that are kept outside. And then we have 
um, leash mania, um, which is zoonotic. It's an intracellular in the monocyte macrophage phagocytic um, system of the host. Number of species and subspecies is very confusing. Um, there's a human and canine parasite, cutaneous and visceral forms of disease, but both involve skin lesions. The right of infection is transmission from the bite of an infected um, sandfly. The sandfly is present, but not important pests in most of the U.S. Other routes of infection include possible transmission from skin lesions or vertical transmission. It's zoonotic, so dogs important reservoirs for human infection in some parts of the world. There's many in life cycle. <clears throat> we have two forms of the disease. Like I said, we have visceral lesion um, maniasis, which organisms are generalized. There's non um, pruritic um, dermatitis or alopecia, generalized um, lymph dentopathy, chronic wasting, once disease developed, leads to death if untreated. Then we have cutaneous um, side, which is organism localized, localized to a um, lesion. The dogs present with single um, lesions. They have a better prognosis. Um, leishmania in the U.S., species causing cutaneous um, leishmaniasis, um, probably endemic in Texas and other parts of the Southwest. Dogs coming from south of the U.S. border, Middle East. Um, visceral um, leishmania, um, same as cutaneous species in also Southern Europe. Adoptions from Southern Europe, also low level um, endemicity in the U.S. Others are salariates and are amoebas. They're not important, so they're not on the exam, so I'm not going to go over that with you. Lots of more information. My throat's tired. I'm sorry it's so long and boring, um, but that was all for today. I have lecture tomorrow and then Friday, um, but I love you guys, and thank you guys for listening.